Thank you for clicking play. You are not here by accident. We have a very compelling Prophecy Bible study for you today, and we have been percolating on this for months, well over six months, because when we find something that goes against mainstream prophetic interpretations, but yet still fit within the confines of the scripture, well, we need to at least reread the entire New Testament to see if this new percolation, this new revelation from the prophetic layer of scriptures is true. So we've taken our time and we've had many discussions in our prophecy group here and it was time to present the lesson. What we are going to discover here is that the first fruit offering of the bride of Christ will be brought in when she is mature and there are many patterns and types in the scriptures that show that this is true and we're going to present some of them to you today so that you can go through on your own and see if this is true so you can double check our work and see if you have come to the same conclusions but we don't take this lightly because many are looking for a date on the calendar many are looking for a a feast that needs to be fulfilled but the gentile bride that is not the father's criteria for when he sends his son to go snatch his bride. So as I said a little bit ago, the bride is the first fruits offering. And what we've talked about in previous videos is that ensures that the main harvest will be sanctified and that there will be a gleanings harvest. Think of the first fruits offering as a tithe of sorts. So you understand that is a smaller portion than the main harvest. Now, what we have discovered in the scripture is the pattern that shows how the entire first fruit offering will go up when two brides out of the bridal group arrive at accurate prophetic interpretations and have published those interpretations when she's finished her testimony. Let's look at the patterns and we're going to go with the New Testament today just to keep our video short, but you'll find other patterns throughout the entire scriptures. Take a look at Simeon who prophesied over the Christ child. This was a pattern. Look at what Simeon says in Luke 2 verse 25 and we'll read through verse 31 and we're going to study out of the new american standard bible today luke 2 25 and there was a man in jerusalem whose name was simeon and this man was righteous and devout looking for the consolation of israel and the holy spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the holy spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the lord's christ and he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, okay, now he's going to start giving a prophecy. Verse 29, now, Lord, you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. Okay, now, what is interesting is the name Simeon means hearing. So Simeon was hearing the Holy Spirit. Revelation 19.10, this is a reminder to you, you guys know this, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So there's two types of testimony. There is like my personal testimony of how I got saved. I have a personal testimony of how God healed my back. But I have a testimony which I put on YouTube and it is prophetic interpretations. So you see, there's different types of testimony. But what Revelation 19.10 is talking about is prophetic interpretations. All right, next, Simon continues to prophesy. He continues to testify. Look at verses 32 through 35. Simeon goes on to say, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. See, it was always prophesied that the Messiah was also for the Gentiles. So a light of revelation to the Gentiles 
and the glory of your people Israel. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, and think of Mary as the nation of Israel. Mary is a type and shadow of Israel. Her Hebrew name is Miriam. Well, that means rebel. We know Mary was not a rebel. She was chosen of God. She's a type and shadow of Israel who God called them out throughout the Old Testament that they were a rebellious people, a rebellious nation. So Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. All right, so that is one pattern of how we see Simeon. He could not depart until he saw the Christ child with his own eyes and prophesied over the Christ child and blessed the Christ child and prophesied over Israel. And we know that Simeon's prophecy prophecies are accurate. He interpreted what he heard from the Holy Spirit accurately and they were published. All right, next, and this is very important, Jesus provides a pattern for what I'm sharing today. Look at John chapter 17, verses 1 and 4. Listen to Jesus. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Look at verse 4, John 17, 4. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So the Father gave Jesus work that he was to accomplish. Once he accomplished that certain portion of work, because there's a lot of work left to be done, all you have to do is read the book of Revelation and you know there is more for Jesus to finish. So what did Jesus accomplish? What did he finish on the cross? Why did he say it is finished? He finished the work that was required for any repentant soul to receive redemption and eternal life, for them to receive the forgiveness for their sins and have an intimate relationship with the Father and enter into eternal life. But there's a whole lot more work that needs to be done on the part of Jesus the Son. After all, we're still sitting here in our flesh. After all, not all Israel is in belief yet. Not all the prophecies have been completed yet. So for people to say that Jesus finished all the work he was ever going to do, there's nothing left to do. They are not comprehending the work that Christ was sent to do at his first advent. Okay, so John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So I just explained to you the work that Jesus finished. He had poured out his blood, that blood of the holy and righteous and blameless lamb was prophesied of throughout the entire Old Testament, especially the book of Leviticus and all the sacrifices. Hebrews says, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So somebody has got to shed their blood and the father appointed his son at his first advent to shed his blood as forgiveness of our sins. That satisfied the requirements of the law. Okay, so Jesus could not leave the earth at his first advent until he accomplished the work that the Father had given him to do at that time. All right, so that's another pattern that shows the bride does not get to leave this earth. The Father will not rapture up the bride until she has accomplished the work that he has assigned for her to do. Okay, let's take a look at the Apostle Paul, because he provides a pattern. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 24. 
but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. So he's saying, you know what? I don't get to use my retirement savings. You know what? All that studying I did as a Pharisee, hey, that is for nothing. I'm just chucking all that because that does not benefit me. Um, my wife, I've lost my wife. Well, we know that Paul at one time had been married because in the Mishnah it states that you cannot be a Pharisee unless you are married. Well, we see the Apostle Paul's trek through the book of Acts and we notice he, he's not taking along his wife. In fact, he gives an indication that he's not married. What happened? We can, with an educated assumption, conclude that his wife left him or passed away. Either of those options are true. So he left everything behind, even his wife. So he says, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So you see, he is telling us he knew he had a course to finish. He knew the, what the ministry was that God had given him to do and that he would remain on earth until he accomplished it. Therefore, we can make an educated assumption because of what Simeon said, because of what Jesus said, now because of what Paul has said, that the bride is going to figure out what her course is what her assignment is, what her ministry is, and we will accomplish it before the Father removes us from the earth. Now, the Apostle Paul, it was to testify of the gospel of grace of God to Jews and Gentiles. All right, I think we can consider, and we're going to go a little bit further here, that our course is to understand the prophetic passages, accurately testify of them, and get that published. Look at the two witnesses. They very clearly provide a pattern for what I'm saying is true. Revelation 11.3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, so that's the first half of Daniel's 70th week. So these two witnesses in Revelation 11:3, they were prophesying. They were giving accurate interpretations to the Old and New Testament. The church will have the day count for their rapture. It's the bride that doesn't have the day count because we have to wait till she's mature. Okay, staying in Revelation chapter 11, look at verse 7. Here's what God says. When they have finished their testimony, their prophesying, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So you see, their prophesying is finished. Their ministry, their verbal ministry is over with. They've accomplished it. Okay, look at uh, verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Verse 11. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. They stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. So we can expect this whole scene to be televised. The whole world will be watching. Verse 12, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud. So now we see a cloud is going to descend at least part way. And then they're going to go up in the cloud. And their enemies watched them. 
Well, who are their enemies? Well, it's those listed in verse 10, those who were celebrating and sending gifts to each other, who, who saw it was being televised. So all their enemies have watched them. Now, have you noticed there is a disagreement against in the body of Christ whether the rapture will be seen or not seen? Great division over this. Well, when you understand there are two upward raptures, this is very easy to reconcile. Christ's first ascension was hidden. Nobody saw that on resurrection day. He sent the ladies off to go tell the men in the upper room that he's resurrected. They left, then he ascended to his father. His second ascension in Acts, that was seen. Enoch's rapture was not seen. Elijah's rapture was seen. So you see, this is how important these types and shadows are in the scriptures. They help us understand Bible prophecy. Oh, I love this. All right, so now, when the two witnesses finish their testimony, they are resurrected and raptured. The entire church goes up with them in Revelation 12, 5, because Revelation chapter 11 and 12 are layered on top of each other. It's talking about two different geographic locations. So with an educated assumption, we can understand the whole church goes up, the global church from every nation, they will go up. Those who are standing around them will see them go up in a cloud. <laughs> okay, so the church is the man-child. The church is the rod of iron. They are the children of the bridegroom. You see, after Revelation chapter 3, you don't see the word church in the book of Revelation again until the very end because God uses a different term for the church. He, it's named something else. That should not be a surprise because there's many names for Jesus. So, since the church is the body of Christ, obviously there's other names for the church. So don't get all hung up and stick to that man-made tradition that the church goes up in Revelation chapter 3 and it's never heard again, heard of again in the book of Revelation. The church's name has been changed because the DNA has been changed because the bride the rib of Christ has been resurrected, raptured, because those seven letters are written to the left behind church. Read them again as if the pre-trib rapture of the bride has already occurred, and those seven letters are telling them why they are left behind and what they need to do in order to overcome martyrdom, because many will be martyred, or to still be alive and remain at the mid-trib rapture of the church that goes up mid-trib, Revelation 12, 5. Okay, so the Father is going to bring the entire field into unity. It's just that the brides, they come into unity, agreement, and understand the accurate prophetic interpretations first. So just like the two witnesses, when the bride, two brides, this is why we're thinking it only takes two brides that are in agreement, in unity, and have accurate Bible prophecy interpretations and get them published. Whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, I don't know. There's many ways to publish our testimony. When that happens, the whole first fruits offering. All the brides get to go up at that pre-trib rapture. So let's listen to how important unity is to the Father and how important maturity is to the Father. Let's look at Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, it takes all five offices of the church to accomplish this goal. Yet most Christians, if you attend a mainstream evangelical church, you're not even getting exposure to all five offices in order for the congregation to be in unity or for a Christian to become mature. So you see, the bride has sought out, as she's gone outside the brick and mortar confines of the church because she understands there's more to it than this. Now, I love how our churches have done a fabulous job of proclaiming the simple gospel of salvation. In fact, proclaiming the simple gospel of salvation is so simple, even a child can do it, and many children are doing it. They even know what is required to be saved and receive eternal life with Jesus Christ. But we want to grow up to maturity. That means you've got to go into the deeper things. You've got to venture into Bible prophecy because the entire Bible is prophetic. There is a prophetic layer that needs to be tapped into. Okay, getting back to Ephesians 4, look at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Okay, remember, it's the children of the bride chamber. They are the church because they're not a mature son of God. They're just resting in the simple salvation of grace. A wonderful place to be. But oh my goodness, <laughs> they've got to grow up, right? And that you have. I know that this community here, you've stuck with us this long because I know you want the deeper things. You want to understand Bible prophecy. Okay, so verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So this is what I know you are seeking to do. I hope we have accurately shown you why this team feels that the reason why the father is waiting to rapture the bride company is because he's waiting until there's fruit mature in the field. That's how I harvest my garden. That's how I pick my first fruits. I don't pick a calendar date. I don't pick a feast date. I watch over it. I do what I can to make sure it's getting more sunlight. I keep my eye on it and then I bring it in. Now, if I don't, I have learned the deer will come into my garden and eat my first fruits because they are watching it also. So are the squirrels and the gophers. They are watching the first fruits as well. All right, I think you know what that means. <laughs> Thank you for watching all the way to the end. One more little thing. We're thinking about doing live streams. And that will be a real challenge for me. I am a Bible nerd, I'm not a techie. The thought of having to learn something technology-wise in a public setting is very daunting to me because I don't wanna waste your time and have to watch through my learning curve. But anyways, that's something you can be praying about. Maybe you'll say, no, Sue, don't bother with live streams. But we would really like to interact with all of you on a more intimate level and even maybe have some of you on to our live stream. So these are just some thoughts we're percolating and you can give your opinion on that. Thank you for watching. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.